Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. I'm Jagdeep Chandler, the director of um, the National Institute, and it is as as much my as my pleasure, but also my sad duty to introduce the work that you're about to hear Corrado Machiavelli present. The Institute, as you all know, um, uh, uh, was founded in 1938, and unfortunately, this is not the first time we've had to enter and think about the implications of a war um, on the European continent and what it means for the global economy, but also the people living in it. The work that we're about to hear from will be presented briefly by Corrado and is a result of a huge effort by other colleagues as well, Paul Mortimer Lee, Iana Liadzi, Patricia Sanchez, Juanino, as well as many other people in the Institute as we try to get to grips with what this might mean for the economy. It's important to bear in mind this is a, a first pass. Corrado will spend some time going through the mechanisms that we see out there that will be affecting the global economy as a result of this war. Um, and it will be something that will be revised. Our February outlooks um, released just a few weeks ago have now have to be revised as a result of this war. The significant numbers that Prada will go through will tell you it changes not only the perspective um, uh, growth and inflation rates that we might see in the world, but also the dilemma that faces policymakers as we come out of the COVID crisis um, will be underlined in triplicate. There will be an even more problematic issue facing our policymakers as a result uh, of this war. And at the end of the presentation, Paul Mortimer Lee will come in to say some words about that as well. We may have some time for questions. Uh, my only regret this morning is that neither Iana or Patricia are able to join us because they have prior engagements elsewhere. And you'll know we set up this uh, um, special seminar uh, with, with very short notice. So I'm grateful for you all for joining us this morning. Let me, um, without um, delaying the presentation any further, turn to Corrado who will outline our analysis as it stands. But as I've said, it's an initial estimate of what we see the implications are. But from that, we expect to um, change as the facts change and indeed put further policy interventions are considered. Corrado, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Jaji. Thanks very much everyone for joining the, um, the webinar. So <clears throat> in the next um, minutes, I will talk about the um, our policy paper on the cost and the Russian-Ukraine conflict, which is indeed joint work with the colleagues uh, that Jajit mentioned. Um, so our February baseline was, um, uh, in terms of GDP growth, was 3.6% um, for this year uh, for the USA, 2.3% next year. Um, and that has been revised down um, as a result of that, uh, of, of the conflict by more than 0.5% for the current year and uh, about 1.4% uh, uh, for the next year. For the euro area, we had in the February baseline 3.8% uh, GDP growth this year and 2.5%. And that is now being revised down by about 0.8% uh, for the current year and uh, about 1.5% for the next year. For the UK, uh, as well, we had 4.8% uh, uh, for 2022 and 1.3% for uh, next year. And we now see the UK uh, GDP growth being reduced by about 0.8% um, in uh, the current year, so to about 4%. And uh, GDP growth will reach 0.5% next year uh, uh, in the UK. So it will be a reduction again of about 0.8%. So we estimate that for the global economy, this has a, a, a huge cost, which is uh, we've estimated about $1 trillion uh, of global GDP. Uh, the implication of the, of the uh, escalation uh, um, of the conflict would be uh, that inflation will uh, ratchet up further and recession risk uh, are mounting uh, indeed. Um, now, the transmission mechanism um, that we have explored is through our National Institute Global Econometric Model, which is a trade-linked uh, model of uh, uh, 60 countries and regions. And we've explored different channels given the complexity of the situation in which we are. Of course, uh, there would be uh, um, a direct effect uh, on, uh, uh, um, say, uh, retaliation from uh, um, 
the West to Russia in terms of GDP and increasing energy price. But of course, on top of that, there would be uh, the effect of uh, increasing political risk that we have taken into account through our investment premium uh, uh, in the model, the effect of uh, migration outflow from Ukraine, which will imply an increase, a significant increase in public expenditure in the recipient countries, but also government expenditure, which will go up as a result of uh, increasing defense needs. And finally, exchange rate effects, which of course will affect firstly, uh, the Russian ruble, uh, uh, and uh, with implications also for, for Russian uh, inflation and import prices, which we expect uh, will go up uh, significantly. Now, of course, Russia is, is very uh, interlinked uh, uh, to the world economy, uh, with the world economy. So Russia and Ukraine are important suppliers of commodities. Russia in particular is a supplier of titanium, palladium, wheat, and corn. And we envisage that as a result of that, there could be supply chain problems, uh, particularly in industries such as cars, smartphones, um, and aircraft. Um, while Russia and Ukraine are, so to say, small in relation to the global economy, so if one looks at the trade links uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, goods, of course, there are significant uh, uh, areas in which they are very uh, uh, important, such as energy and food. Um, now, in terms of energy, the, um, the uh, production of oil and natural gas is very substantial and the uh, exposure to uh, Russian exports of energy uh, is particularly high uh, in the EU. So the EU dependency ratio is about 60%. So a lot of uh, uh, almost 60% of energy needs of uh, the EU uh, are um, fulfilled through import of that and uh, the majority of these come indeed uh, from uh, from Russia so that the, the, that exposure varies a lot so is, is is very high in Germany and Italy but also uh, high in, in some Central Eastern European uh, countries so in our simulation we've assumed that energy prices will go up by about 40 dollars uh, per barrel which would make uh, energy prices exceed the $100 uh, dollar, dollar per barrel threshold uh, uh, and getting very close to the high levels that we witnessed or the peak in 2008. Um, there is clearly political risk and uncertainty. Um, An increasing political risk uh, means that uh, foreign direct investment uh, to Russia will soon dry up, dry up and restrictions on exports as a result of uh, uh, sanctions, international sanctions, uh, means that uh, Russia's reliance on money printing to finance the war would increase, which could add to the inflationary uh, pressure. Talking about um, assumptions, uh, the um, one element is the flow of asylum seekers that from Ukraine will require higher public spending. So we've included in our model, the um, possibility that this outflow could reach 4 million refugees as the crisis unfolds. And of course, that would mean that uh, public spending will increase, particularly in the recipient countries, um, which are um, um, you know, direct um, uh, recipient of these uh, outflows, such as Poland uh, and Germany. But also we expect higher public spending uh, to, uh, uh, to bolster uh, military and, and defense needs, uh, and that is going to add to pressure on resources and therefore uh, inflation. Um, so the defense budget, we've seen during the last couple of weeks that many countries have boosted military spending. So um, here is a graph that um, shows how defense expenditure of NATO members have uh, evolved in the last five years. Um, so this, uh, as, as a percentage of GDP, is still below the 2% um, sort of need or uh, sort of requirements, that the 2%, say, uh, NATO threshold. Uh, but uh, countries such as Germany has indeed um, hinted that they would increase public expenditure 
in a sense, giving in to the U.S. pressure to, to reach the, the 2% threshold uh, GDP. Outside of the NATO, we also expect countries such as Sweden, Finland, and several Eastern European countries, which will, uh, will see an acceleration in defense spending in response to the crisis. So we've made assumptions about increasing in, in, in public expenditure um, in, um, in, in, in many uh, um, uh, countries in the EU as a result of that. Um, now, for the economic cost of, uh, of Russia, we can see that, um, you know, the, of course, the, the, the effect of the shocks are, are going to play different roles here. Uh, clearly, energy prices are going to, um, the increase in energy prices are going to increase uh, revenues from, from energy exports, but this is not going to be enough. Uh, to offset the uh, cost uh, of the of this of the of the Russian Ukraine conflict, in fact, um, we see that you know as a result of um, trade disruption, exchange rate premia, as well as investment premium because the country risk will go up. Uh, the overall effect on the Russian economy will be uh, indeed negative, and uh, we had um, in our baseline uh, three point two. A percent uh, in our February as a baseline for the current year for GDP and 2.5 for next year. So we can clearly see that, you know, in the light of that, uh, Russian GDP uh, uh, growth uh, will be much, much lower. So about minus two uh, percentage points lower for this year and about minus 2.5 percentage lower uh, for next year. Coming to inflation, um, the um, inflation, uh, of course, is going to increase as a result of energy prices. Uh, the extent to which inflation will increase in, in many countries depend on also on the country's uh, exposure to Russia, as well as their openness. Now, for the U.S., for instance, we had uh, previously um, in our baseline uh, February focused 4.6% this year and 2.5%. Next year, um, we have now revised those figures to 7.1 for the current year and 3.5 for the uh, next year. For the euro area, we had previously 3.1% inflation for 2022 and 1.3% inflation for next year. And we now have revised those figures to 5.5% for 2022 and 2.1% for next year. For the UK, um, we have 7% um, inflation um, currently from 5.3% uh, uh, um, in the previous year and 4.4% now um, from the previous uh, um, um, from the previous figure. Now, um, the um, in terms of the um, in terms of the um, the uh, UK monetary policy response, uh, we're still working on the monetary policy implications. Of course, one aspect of NIGEM is that uh, the, um, the, the new inflation is gonna warrant a strong monetary policy response, but of course, you know, inflation will uh, and could run higher in case monetary policy response will not be as, uh, as strong. Of course, um, that um, coming to the, following um, slide. So that clearly uh, suggests that, um, you know, if we have to look at the implications of the, uh, um, of the conflict, that is going to be a significant hit to the global economy. But that new um, uh, increase spike in inflation is going to create a dilemma for monetary policymakers, in particular, um, the extent to which they, they'll want to delay um, any uh, monetary policy tightening in the light of uh, recessionary consideration. Um, so the, the bottom line of the simulation, as Jajid was saying, is that it is pretty much a work in progress. So uh, it will be revised in the light of the next uh, forecast round. But of course, uh, it could also get worse uh, if Russian gas supplies were to seize entirely the UA, the EU could get um, into, uh, into a recession. Uh, whereas for the UK, as we discussed, because it relies mostly on Norway and produces a sizable chunk of its own gas need, interruption in supply chains 
uh, uh, would be uh, less likely, uh, in, in energy supply would be less likely, but there would be effect from higher wholesale, wholesale gas prices. So I'll stop here. Um, Thank you very much, Corrado. Uh, a lot of things to go through there, uh, very short order. Let me be clear, the paper is available on our website and we very much welcome uh, comments at any time on the work that we've done or thoughts as we how we might progress it as news comes along. Uh, and we may have time for some questions after Paul's intervention. Uh, if you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A and we'll try and deal with it, if not now, um, shortly thereafter. Paul. Thank you, Jedge, and uh, thank you, Corrado, uh, for that excellent presentation. Yeah, so the, the position presents a huge dilemma for monetary policy makers, uh, because as we've seen, we've had a big upsurge in inflation as a response to the increased demand for goods in uh, the world economy and a constriction of supply due to COVID. Uh, and monetary policy makers, I think, have got behind the curve in many ways. Um, uh, haven't responded soon enough uh, to the inflationary threat. And there's a real danger that inflation becomes embedded in the world economy. Uh, now we've got another shock that, as Corrado uh, ably demonstrated, simultaneously raises inflation but pushes growth down. What should monetary policymakers do? And um, uh, what it looks like, at least in the Bank of England, is that they're going to keep on raising rates because they're very afraid, and I think that um, fear is justified, uh, that the increase in prices is going to pass through to wages, and so we're going to have long-lasting second-round effects of inflation. Uh, the problem is um, that confidence is already fragile. Uh, we don't know what Mr. Putin will do next, um, if and when he occupies Ukraine. How does he respond? going down the line. Uh, in particular, you know, if there's resistance in Ukraine with arms coming from other countries, how does it respond to that? So the downside risks to growth, I don't think, have, have finished. And there's clearly a danger that if central banks are too vigorous uh, in responding to inflation, uh, they'll push the economy into recession. Um, after all, let's face it, they can't do anything about the inflation that's coming in the next few months. Monetary policy takes a considerable time to work through to inflation and work through the real economy and expectations. The increase in inflation coming from higher energy prices is already baked in. We're probably going to see inflation of 8% by April. There's nothing the Bank of England can do about that. What it is out to, to achieve is to limit how much that is passed through in second round effects uh, to inflation. Do they know? how much interest rates will affect second round effects at this stage? And the answer is no, I don't think they do. It's a clearly highly uncertain environment. And our advice would be if they feel they need to raise rates, they should go slowly. Because if they don't, we could end up with stagflation, with a recession and inflation, because the inflation outlook over the next 12 months or 18 months is already predetermined. So I would, uh, I would counsel caution in what they do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I wonder if I could just follow up on the second round effect question, then also ask you how fiscal policymakers, not only here, but abroad, should be approaching their budget planning for this year as a result of this. Um, and there's two parts, therefore. Be very clear about the need to guard against second round effects. How do you suppose we should best guard against that. Is that simply a much more gradual path for interest rates and careful examination of surveys, wage setting uh, and, and price setting of markups by firms so that we can respond more quickly or make statements about what we might do in the long run? How do we actually deal with second round effects? And secondly, it goes back to the budget question. There's a, a, a very strong desire amongst policymakers to consolidate fiscal positions after the ratchet up in debt after the financial crisis and also uh, COVID. How do we approach the fiscal problems now? And, and we've got some questions coming in, so I'd be wanting to turn to those. But I'm kind of wondering very briefly, how do we, how do the, those policymakers deal with those very, very tricky dilemmas this year? Well, I think what, what's got to be done is to emphasize the long run objectives of policy. 
Um, whether you raise rates by 25 basis points or 50 basis points in March, not going to make much difference to where inflation goes. But you've got to say that we will raise rates uh, to the extent necessary over the next couple of years and to be absolutely clear in that. And I think that probably requires some action short term. That's not a credible commitment unless it's accompanied by action. So I can understand why the bank may want to go. In terms of fiscal policy, it's clear that the demands on fiscal policy are going to increase because of the, um, uh, the crisis. We're going to see more refugees coming. Uh, refugees, the OECD reckon cost about 10,000 euros per head. Um, so that's going to add a lot to uh, fiscal costs, depending on how many come to the UK. Um, and then we're going to have to see an increase in defence expenditure. And simultaneously, on a longer term basis, we're going to have to reduce, Europe as a whole is going to have to reduce its reliance, uh, not just on Russian gas, but probably on fossil fuels as well. So we're probably going to have to see an acceleration in um, investment in um, green infrastructure, if you like. Um, should that how should that be financed how should all that be financed my feeling it's got to be financed by reducing other public expenditure and or increasing taxes this is with the economy at full employment any increase in fiscal outlays on refugees defense and green energy needs to have resources come from elsewhere rather than from borrowing if it just comes from borrowing we're just going to see more inflation and that's how the resources will be made available the government has to make tough choices and decide to cut other other expenditure or increase taxes thank you paul very clear um i'm going to take a couple of questions uh maybe i'll, I'll bundle up the first two carado if i may we have a, a question in the first instance from um a friend of the institute sophie henkel who's asking what's the actual calibration of the energy prices and i think that leads nicely into uh, Shekhar Hari Kumar's question really about whether our impact on Russia is, is too low. Should it be higher given longer term trade sanctions and trade frictions after the conflict? Now, of course, the, the energy price is in a way going in the opposite direction to the trade friction. So perhaps you could talk through that. And, and I, I think we need to accept this is a linear model. So we're, we're not necessarily capturing tail risk in the way that we might want to. But the risk will always be in 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 uh, the way we portray uh, uh, the uncertainty um, by using distributional charts of where we are. So I think the risk is probably on the downside of the point estimate we have at the moment. But Crado, perhaps I could ask you to go through those uh, the answers to those two questions. Yes. Uh, well, thank, thanks for the questions. Um, so in terms of the uh, assumption on on the energy prices, uh, we did. Um, increase uh, energy prices, oil prices in particular, um, which were one, one of the main variables in, in Niger uh, by $40 uh, per barrel. So this is the type of shock that we're looking at. Um, we've um, calibrated it as a continued continuous shock because of course we were uncertain about the duration of the, uh, of the, of the, of the crisis. Um, in the uh, global economic outlook, we did um, further exercises about the uh, stochastic simulation of that. And in particular, we mixed the possibility of the shock being temporary as well as the shock being permanent. But we, um, for these, for these a policy paper, we've calibrated the shock as a, a for now permanent shock, because of course, uh, we don't know about the, its duration. Um, so that is for the calibration of the shock itself. Uh, when it comes to the effect on Russian uh, GDP, um, as Jajid uh, said clearly, you know, uh, there is a, a certain extent to which Nigerian can capture that. Uh, but of course, you know, with all the due limitation that uh, Nigerian is a trade model. So trade linkages are very well developed. Um, financial sector, financial linkages are not as developed uh, in Niger, uh, is mainly a trade model. But of course, we do have that effect through investment premium, exchange rate premium, which we do model. Um, as uh, you know, illustrated during the presentation, uh, revenues from higher energy prices get in the way in the sense that they're going to add up to, to the GDP figures. Uh, increasing public expenditure is going to um, adapt to the uh, to the GDP to the GDP figures. Uh, but, you know, of course, it is indeed a lower bound uh, uh, and the situation could, could get worse. Uh, but 
this is what we have uh, as a first estimate, balancing all the different shocks uh, out. Thank you, Carano. I have an interesting question from Sebastian Werner. Perhaps, Paul, you can, can help with this. Uh, the question is, if Germany does not receive natural gas from Russia and cannot obtain natural gas from elsewhere, uh, you, 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 you just, you know, you're going to get a world in which there'll be actual shortages of, of inputs, which I think also relates to the question from uh, Martin uh, Moti at uh, CMB uh, or Martin Motto. I can't quite read that. Forgive me, Martin, if I've got that wrong. Um, uh, 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 as to whether we've also got potential for negative supply shock to productivity as a result of inputs being in short supply and firms having to scrap their investment plans. So I wonder if that is something we have thought about or should be thinking about now, or is it a little bit too early to be introducing those kinds of stories as well? No, I mean, I think, um, you know, the ECB looked at what would happen if um, gas supplies to Europe fell by 10 percentage points. And remember that gas from, uh, from Russia accounts for 40 percent of uh, European gas. So they reckoned that a 10 percent drop could not 0.7 percent of GDP. So mm -hmm. if we multiply about that by four, we're looking we're looking at a European recession. Um, and now the timing is not as bad as it could be. So I think it's possible maybe, you know, depending on what, how the weather to get through this period, but gas stocks are already low in Europe and the real crunch point will be next winter, I think, um, if, there's, if there's no Russian gas. And, and this, if I can just say something about um, the effects we've got on Russia in terms of GDP, when you look at what we've got, which is basically 5% of GDP in 2023, uh, one of the things we thought was, is that consistent with what President Biden and Boris Johnson and everything, everybody else is saying about their objectives uh, to hit the Russian economy? And, and the answer is no. Um, it's about the same uh, reduction as we saw in the 1998 Russian crisis. So mm. it's really reasonable. But mm. if we really want to hurt Russia, we have to hurt ourselves by cutting back on imports of Russian energy. You know, currently the SWIFT ban does not apply to energy transactions. So, you know, we're putting pressure on Russia. If we want to hurt them, there's no way of doing that without hurting ourselves by more, I'm afraid. And that might mean pushing Europe close to recession. And, you know, that's, I guess, Mr. Putin's gamble that the Europeans won't be willing to do that. Yeah, thank you, Paul. It's a, a extremely interesting gambit for us to be thinking about having, in a sense, pushed ourselves into recession just two years ago in order to deal with the COVID nineteen crisis. You know, are we prepared to go uh, not not as far in the same way, but do things that are genuinely damaging to the economy for a longer term aim? And you talked a few minutes ago about the need to focus on those long term aims, which are not only about price stability and prosperity for all, but the necessary steps to ensure a more peaceful world. And I think these are the things we'll be grappling with. Um, I, I think we promised a 30 minute seminar, we're up to 30 minutes, I suggest we break now. There's some questions that have come in. We will collect them and come back to you. Please do give us your details so you can. If you have some other questions uh, or things that you want us to consider as we go into our outlook for the spring, uh, it, uh, do email us on inquiries at nisa.act.uk and we will come back to you. Uh, we're an independent research institute, keenly interested in doing our public service by trying to understand these very difficult times that we're living through. Um, we thank you for the questions. Thank you for your interest uh, this morning. Please stay involved with what we do and continue to talk for us, with us. So that helps us think through these things. And we'd very much welcome the questions that you will have. And in answering them, uh, we as an institute learn. And we hope as well that our policymakers learn and ultimately make better choices. Thank you, Corrado. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Iana and uh, 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 Patricia. Um, we'll see you very soon somewhere, uh, no doubt. Good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye.